Hey everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Ecom Elevated. I'm your host, Pete from Soapbox. We made this show for listeners like you and mine who are looking to grow, build, and succeed in the e-commerce industry. However, this landscape is consistently changing with new players, ideas, and business models being introduced daily, which at times can be a lot to manage. That's why we sit down with industry leaders to discuss their tips for success, reveal their secrets of the trade, and so much more, which you can use to elevate your business above the competition. Welcome, and I really hope you enjoy the show. We've had a couple established brands come and share with us their tips for success. Now for a little change of pace. Our next guest is a young entrepreneur that has developed a brand, product, and marketing strategy that is as unique as she is. Now she's here to share some of the challenges and successes she's experienced since her official product release earlier this year. Please welcome the co-founder and CEO of Fun Gal Snacks, Marilyn Yang. Hi, Marilyn. Hey, Pete. Thanks again for having me. Of course. First, I want to start with congratulating you on your official launch. When was that? Actually, it was just April of this year. It's pretty crazy. I guess it's only really been about four months. It kind of feels like longer than that in some ways, but also shorter than that in some ways. So, uh, but yeah, it's definitely been early days. I bet you probably had some really long days and some pretty stressful days yourself. <laughs> yeah, Tell us a little even, bit. Uh, yeah, even before the launch too, actually. I believe it. And tell us a little bit about Fun Gal Snacks. What are you guys about? What is it? Yeah, sure. So Fun Gal Snacks is actually our parent company. What we hope for Fun Gal Snacks to be is kind of a platform for all sorts of different types of innovative snacks using what we call underloved veggies. So if you go to the grocery store, you know, you kind of see the same vegetables over and over and again in the snack aisle. So see a lot of kale, probably maybe some chickpeas or whatever, and definitely a lot of potatoes. Uh, we're kind of looking to make snacks out of the snack or, or out of the vegetables that you just don't tend to see at all. So the first product that we've come out with just this April, as I mentioned earlier, is called Papadelics. It's a crunchy mushroom chip snack that's made with shiitake mushrooms. So you don't, I definitely don't see a ton of mushrooms around, uh, at least not yet. No, not yet. I, I'm not going to lie. I actually tried a, a bag myself not too long ago, and it is actually surprisingly really good, completely different taste that I was expecting. So I definitely suggest someone try that. Now, Papa Delix is unique on its own. How did you come up with such a unique and fun product right off the bat? It was pretty organic, actually, how it came about. So my co-founder, Mike Caselli, and I were actually a couple as well. And uh, actually, looking back in retrospect, we obviously didn't meet and immediately were like, okay, let's go start a mushroom snack company. But um, we actually, one of the first things we bonded over when we first met was actually our mutual love of mushrooms. So looking back, it actually makes so much sense in a really funny way. But really, uh, we, we kind of joked that it was kind of our COVID baby. I mean, we're both actually from finance backgrounds and always wanted to start a company, but just never really had the right idea. And so we were kind of searching for the idea for a really long time. And actually during COVID, uh, I guess we were based in New York City, so essentially the only time we ever went outside during that period was to go grocery shopping. And so to entertain ourselves, I guess, we kind of just tried every single snack in the snack aisle. So I started trying some interesting stuff, like I got into some cauliflower snacks, which were pretty good. I um, actually found some pretty good chickpea snacks, for example. And it just came up really organically one day, like, oh, I wonder if there's any mushroom snacks out there. Uh, there have to be mushroom snacks by now, or so we thought. Um, and really, it started out as us just as consumers uh, looking for a mushroom snack and going out there. And what we found was that the stuff that's out there today was largely kind of boring. So unflavored, unbranded, uh, just not a lot of exciting stuff going on. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we're both big foodies and follow kind of the health and wellness world. And so we found that or kind of even before we started the company, we started seeing mushroom coffees and mushroom teas start popping up. Uh, a lot happening in the supplement space with adaptogens. Um, and then also at the same time, this was when there's been a lot of talk, of course, about psilocybin and on the psychedelic end of things. And so it just felt like the right time in pop culture to be doing something with mushrooms. And so the more we looked into it and we did a few months of diligence, the more excited we got and the more we kind of really saw that there wasn't anything out there like what we wanted to do. And so we went ahead and went for it. Yeah, I mean, 
honestly, you went a whole different route that I went, you know, <laughs> along with everybody else in COVID, right? I went little Debbie's, I went chips, you know, soda. That's where everybody went during the COVID. And I'm glad that at least someone picked up the healthy side of things. Yeah, it's actually really funny you now, say that because you, uh, it's actually really funny you say that because actually, uh, I guess during COVID, um, I, actually, I always joke that I was always going down the aisles that hadn't been picked dry because there was a period where the, the whole entire grocery store was sold out, except for the stuff that I would buy, which was really funny. <laughs> that is super funny. And you touched on this a little bit. You have a really strong background in marketing and in finance, which I know it played a big role in your ongoing success. But the other areas involved in creating a CPG Brown, how did you gap those areas? You know, where did you where did you find help in those areas? Yeah, so I guess the first thing is we, we knew what we didn't know for sure. So we knew kind of conceptually how to run a business. You know, I come from private equity, so I've kind of looked at companies in all sorts of different industries, but CPG is a whole different animal. And we kind of knew, we don't know really even how to cook. So um, we, we just knew there were areas that we needed help with if we were talking about launching a snack company. Um, and actually another thing, I guess, that I got really good at, I guess, working in finance is that in, in the finance world, you tend to outsource everything that you can basically. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that there would be some sort of third party help out there in the form of some sort of maybe like consulting firm or even like a freelance person who, you know, maybe formulate snacks on the side. Um, and so we pretty quickly knew that we needed help on the R&D side. I mean, we just wouldn't know where to start in terms of how to, you know, formulate a snack and come up with flavors and uh, make it commercially viable and all of those good things. And so we quickly kind of essentially come up from a Google search, kind of looked at different product development agencies. There's actually quite a few out there. Uh, but actually, the, the lucky break we had with the firm that we ended up using, they're called Rodeo CPG. They're actually super awesome for anyone looking to start a CPG company. Essentially, they're made up of all former CPG entrepreneurs who now essentially work in this company. And all they do is help emerging CPG brands start their brands. Um, so they do everything from R&D to helping you with supply chain. I think they even have expanded into like sales and finance help. So they really are a one-stop shop and we had an amazing time working with them. But it was really kind of serendipitous how we connected with them. Um, I do some angel investing personally on the side. And actually there's one company I had been looking to invest in when I kind of, uh, she, she has a smoothie shake company and I kind of asked her for advice in the early days in terms of how she went about founding her business and and she was the one who actually connected us to Rodeo because someone uh, from Rodeo is actually on her board of directors for her company. And so I think a lot of lucky breaks is maybe the short answer, but also, I guess, not being afraid to just, you know, look for outside resources. Uh, you know, you don't have to try to do everything yourself, basically. Yeah, and, and that can definitely be really scary, you know, looking for someone to really manage a big portion of your business. What are some of the things that you kept in mind while you were searching for some of these strategic partners? I think a big thing is someone that really understood the vision of what we were doing. And I think it was important to us. We ultimately went with Rodeo because, you know, we spoke to a few other kind of companies that did the same thing, but they were more so focused on, you know, a lot of their clients were people like Kellogg's or some of those big names out there. And I think it was important for us to work with someone who's been through that entrepreneurial journey. So I thought that was super important for us, just working with someone who kind of gets exactly where we're coming from and is also in the industry kind of on the ground level. They, they know kind of what we're trying to do with mushrooms and they see the opportunity as well. And um, I guess big kudos for them for willing to work with us at the time, because I think all we really had was like a concept. So um, you know, they really did it, on their end too, right? They were taking a leap of faith in terms of working with us. So um, I think someone that just mutually gets it. Um, and also I think it's important for uh, the founder or the entrepreneur. So uh, Mike and myself, we had a very clear idea of what exactly we wanted. We knew we wanted a crunchy mushroom snack that was flavored. Um, and it, it was, you know, it was pretty specific at that point. We weren't like, we weren't sure if we were trying to decide between jerkies. We weren't sure if we wanted it to be a whole mushroom versus just a, a shape of a mushroom or, you know, mushroom turned into like some other shape. Like, I think we already knew kind of pictured in our head what we wanted. I think that made it easier to communicate to a third party as well. Yeah. And just being able to describe, you know, what your actual end game is, is huge when you're talking to, to, a, you know, any strategic partner, getting their vision and your vision on the same page is probably one of the hardest things. 
and something that every business has really had to learn over the last couple of years, and I know you have done very well, is pivot effectively, right? You started this during COVID and everything has changed, you know, during the start of it, in the middle, and now even now at the end, everything is consistently changing every single time. But not every single change that comes through requires some type of pivot. So how do you know when you need to implement some type of change? Yeah, I think it's definitely something we're still trying to figure out ourselves as well. But I think the big thing is, you know, especially once we released our snacks or once the snack was actually out there. Um, so I guess starting April of this year, we started getting, you know, certain feedback, like certain people maybe didn't like that we had a certain ingredient in our ingredient list. And um, some people didn't like uh, the fact that it was a whole mushroom versus, you know, actually shaped like a chip. And it was a lot of feedback at once. And so it's easy to get caught up in trying to satisfy everyone. And I think it was important for us to keep in mind that you can never kind of please everyone. And we're not trying to please everyone either. I think we understood that not everyone's going to gravitate towards a mushroom chip for various reasons, even though I think uh, we have had a lot of people come to us and say, you know, I hate mushrooms, but your snacks are amazing. So I think we love when that happens too. Uh, but I mean, it was important for us too to kind of, uh, you know, once we heard the same feedback multiple times, I think we started taking it more seriously. And I think from the types of people too, it mattered. So once we heard certain feedback from, you know, potential wholesale buyers uh, or people who had been in the industry for a long time and kind of had some gravitas, I, I think that's when we really took it more to heart. I think when you're just talking about your kind of your initial customers and in some ways, you know, obviously some, you want to listen to all of your customers, but in terms of whether you should try to satisfy every little one, especially because some feedback actually conflicts with some other feedback you got from someone else. It's kind of important to kind of just take a step back and, and digest what actually makes sense or not. Yeah. And, and you touched base on this a little bit more, uh, a little bit beforehand. And I, I just want to get into a little bit more. What are some ways that you have, you know, you as a business have asked for feedback? What channels do you search for that? Who do you ask and how do you get it? Well, I think the first thing is we try to get almost everyone we meet to try and taste our snacks. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, some random, I think it's this random shipping and logistics company, actually speaking of shipping and logistics that we were speaking to, you know, we, we were just like, oh, well, let's just send you guys some samples. Like we may or may not work together anytime soon, but, you know, we just want to let you know, we want to let you know, want to know what you guys think about it. And so there's a lot of opportunities like that with that we just kind of you know, every situation we have, like all sorts of different people that we meet. Uh, I think we think of everyone as a guinea pig, basically. And so essentially, essentially we're getting <laughs> feedback from all sorts of different people, which I thought was also important because, you know, I think obviously our personal friends and family have tried it, but they may or may not be biased. And, and I think a service provider's view, a random service provider's view on a snack is maybe very different than someone who's you know, from directly the industry you're in. And so I, I think a big thing we've been doing kind of informally is kind of everyone we be, we kind of offer to send samples. Yeah, and that's definitely unique. Not every single company does that, right? You usually have to sign up for something or buy something and get something free. And being that you're going that route is is really awesome. It's really the door to door, the you know, the reaching out to the customer right then and there and getting active feedback. And that's really good. And that's really just a part of what you guys are about. When it comes to your marketing strategy, which to me is the fun part, your guys have gone a whole different route when it comes to releasing your first product. Tell us more about the direction you decided to go. Yes, yeah, so it's pretty interesting, I guess, how it came about. I think we always knew that in the beginning, we would probably more be focused on D to C, even though actually how it turned out is we, we were doing a good amount of wholesale as well. I think namely just because, uh, you know, it, I think we did predict the mushroom trend pretty well. I think it, it is the wave of mushroom interest is definitely starting to hit. And so we've had a ton of actually wholesale interest already. We're actually in 10 states already in terms of independent natural food stores. But on, in terms of the D2C side, I think, um, you know, like many other brands, we weren't super familiar not having launched a D2C brand before, just how effective digital marketing would be. Uh, so we did want to try digital marketing, but we found very quickly and also with my experience with some other startups that I'm kind of tangentially involved with that digital marketing, just the ROIs just aren't what they used to be. Um, and so, and at the same time, we were kind of cautious. We didn't really want to spend a ton of money kind of learning per se. 
because a lot of these platforms, you kind of just need to throw money in and see what happens. It's kind of like a guess and check situation. And we didn't really want to kind of waste all that money, not necessarily knowing if it's going to be successful. And so what we found actually, and, and I guess this was this coincided too, because leading up to our la- actual launch in April was when a lot of the COVID restrictions finally went away al- almost fully. And so we were able to do this, but we kind of shifted to more of like what we call, I guess, almost like guerrilla marketing. And again, I think a lot of this has to do with any opportunity we had to just get people to try our snacks. And I think what we found, too, is just because of how new and innovative and just very different our snack was. A lot of people just don't know what to expect. Like almost everyone who's tried it is like, this is just the complete opposite of what I was expecting. And so a big part of yeah, and a Definitely. big part of that as a result is that we just need people to try it. And so kind of how we've gone about that is we've uh, been doing a lot of street fairs in New York City. We're, we'll be at New York City Summer Streets every Saturday this August in Astor Place. Um, and a bunch of other kind of in-person stuff, like uh, whether it's a trade show. Um, we, we did this vegetarian festival in New York as well. And uh, perhaps most exciting is uh, we're, we're starting to do live events. So... We just announced actually last week that we're an official partner of Electric Zoo Music Festival, which is a major EDM music festival in New York City. Um, It's actually an event that Mike and I have personally been several times. Personally, we're we're both big EDM fans as well. And we even joked, I think, earlier on that, oh, like, if we ever started a snack company, we would have to get it into Electric Zoo. And so in some ways, it's a dream come true. But I think we're super excited about any sort of opportunity to sell quite literally direct to customer kind of in person in such a way so kind of the scale of a festival like this is definitely the the first time we'll be doing something this big yeah this is huge and i'm a, a music festival lover myself i feel like i'm about to be judged but i've been to a ton of music festivals on my own and i was wondering which one of you guys was you know the raver quote unquote but I'm willing. I was willing to bet it was you, Marilyn. I don't know why, but your energy just says I'm about EDM. Well, it's actually all the funny. Time. I mean, both of us are actually big EDM what? fans, and believe it or not, um, how we met. I guess our couple story. We actually met at a nightclub here in New York City, an EDM nightclub, uh, marquee for anyone who's in New York City. And so we, we again, I think in retrospect, right, it makes so much sense that we bonded over mushrooms and both like ddm to the point where we met at an edm club so yeah, a lot of things obviously make a lot of sense but yeah and you know my favorite my favorite thing the you know the whole raver mindset or the whole festival mindset right it's all about love peace and unity and that's what everybody's coming together and i love that your product is doing that it's bringing people together with a whole new experience and just reaching out to a whole new really generation because that's really what you're doing you're reaching out to the next the next generation for us What's been your favorite festival thus far? That's a hard one. I mean, I actually haven't been to that many. I mean, I've been to the same festivals multiple times. Like I've been to Electric Zoo maybe five or six times. Uh, But I've been to Ultra in Miami once. And I think just because it was different and, you know, Ultra is a huge event kind of internationally as well. I think that was just a very memorable experience. Um, Just being in Miami and, uh, you know, I was actually uh, lucky enough to be in the VIP section there as well. So I got a bunch of free stuff, which... I always like. So anytime you give me free stuff, I'll say it's the, the funnest one I've been to, but um, also saw a bunch of uh, DJs that I hadn't seen for a while. But I will say my favorite DJ that I've seen live probably is actually Calvin Harris. And I haven't seen him in a very long time, but I saw him at actually Made in America Music Festival in Philadelphia a long time ago, actually probably like five or six years ago. Um, so kind of two different things there, but basically anywhere there's an EDM person playing, I'll, I'll go. I'm going to hold you to that. We'll, we'll see. But a little birdie did tell me that you may have some festival tickets up for grab. Is that true? Yeah. So actually, uh, I guess coinciding with our announcing that we will be at Electric Zoo as an official partner, we are actually hosting a sweepstakes as well on our website. And so we are raffling off or I guess giving out two three-day general admission tickets to Electric Zoo, so to all three days of the festival. And all you really have to do to enter is you can go to our website, papadelics.com. That's P-O-P-A-D-E-L-I-C-S.com. And pretty much all you have to do is, you know, check off the terms and conditions and enter your name and email. And you'll, you'll be in the system and we'll be doing a drawing. 
And when is the actual winner going to be? So drawn? entries will be accepted until August 25th at 11:59 Eastern, and we will be picking the winner shortly thereafter. So we'll be reaching out to people probably that next day, so August 26th or so. That's awesome. I honestly, I wish I could, you know, be part of that <laughs> trialing, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. Let's see what happens from this point going forward. <laughs> My luck's never that good when it comes to these uh, raffles or any type of lotteries or anything like that. You never know <laughs> at <I guess>. all. <laughs> it's true. It's been a pleasure having you with us today. Any final words of advice for young entrepreneurs like yourself? I guess out we there? already talked a lot about this, but I guess don't be afraid to change course, kind of in general. And I think we've maybe change course in small ways. I think we always stayed true that, you know, obviously we wanted to be making innovative snacks and a mushroom snack with papadelics. But I think how we went about things, we were kind of able and nimble enough. And I think that's what makes startups exciting is that unlike a big corporation, you don't have to deal with all that bureaucracy to, to change your mind. You can kind of just decide like, oh, I, this wasn't working. Let's try something else. You don't have to stay the course, I guess. And so um, I think it's important for, for anyone starting out to maybe keep that in mind that you don't have to be perfect your first time and it's okay to kind of shift directions. Yeah, definitely. How, how are you going to know what success is if you haven't had any failures? Yeah, for sure. Past, and right? actually just trying as much stuff as you can because you never know what hits. Yeah, exactly. Thank you again. It's been so much fun having you on today and I really appreciate you taking the time and hopefully we'll see you again in the next episode. Yeah, thanks again, Pete. And hopefully I'll see you actually at a music festival sometime. Definitely. Hold me to it. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll use some of the insights provided on today's show to elevate your own business's success. As always, listen and subscribe to Ecom Elevated or follow our Soapbox social media for more amazing advice. I've been your host, Pete from Soapbox. Have a great week, and we'll see you in the next episode of Ecom Elevated. Ecom Elevated.